This is Ross Brown, and you're watching the TV Writer Podcast. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. My name's Gray Jones, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, episode 47, for Monday, January 16th, 2012. Happy New Year to you. Hope you're doing well. Well, today, I have an interview with writer, author, producer, and professor Ross Brown, who just happens to be the author of Bite Size Television, Create Your Own Series for the Internet. And I know that a lot of us have been interested in creating our own content or series for the internet, and you're going to love this interview. Speaking about the internet, <laughs> one of our news items this, th this week is I do want to apologize because over the last week there have been some issues with the podcast websites, and that's because the server that hosts the webs websites was hit by a malicious attack a little over a week ago. Unfortunately, there's some great expense and lots of time involved in dealing with that and getting everything back up and running. It should be back now. Um, let me know at mail at tvwriterpodcast.com if you do experience any issues with websites. And you can always follow me on Twitter, at Gray Jones is my handle. And you can find out about the latest developments, which hopefully will not include more issues like this. Um, we do have some new homework on the table, and that is to order Troy DeVold's Reality TV, an insider's guide to TV's hottest market, Read it and submit questions by the first week of February because Ross will be on the podcast in early February. We're not going to have a video tips this week, uh, largely because of these server issues. Uh, I've been working hard to get everything back up and running and just didn't have time. But a little tiplet, if you will, if you are an editor of any kind and you enjoyed the Noise Industries FX Factory Pro demo that I did a few weeks ago, I do want to mention one plugin available called Yanobox Nodes. They are sponsoring this week's episode of the podcast. You can go to yanobox.com to find out more about this plugin. It's an amazing plugin that produces a really unique style of presenting different types of information on the screen or even cool things like, um, uh, like fiber optic cables or, or different kind of uh, particle type effects. Uh, like I said, really unique. Watch the demo video on the site and find out more about that plug plugin. Thanks to Yenabox for sponsoring this episode. And now about Ross Brown. Ross Brown began his writing career on NBC's award-winning comedy series, The Cosby Show. He went on to write and produce such hit TV shows as The Facts of Life, Who's the Boss, and Step by Step. He has created primetime series for ABC, CBS, and the WB. His play, Hindsight, received two stage readings at the Pasadena Playhouse, Pasadena, California, in July of 2007, and his short play, Field of Vision, was performed in Chicago at the Appetite Theater's Bruschetta 2008 Festival. He is an assistant professor of film and media arts at Chapman University in Orange, California, where he developed a series of cutting-edge courses on creating TV series for the internet. He's the author of Bite Size Television, Create Your Own TV Series for the Internet. You can find out more about Ross and about his book at bitesized.tv. That's B-Y-T-E-S-I-Z-E-D dot TV or if you're in the States, B-Y-T-E-S-I-Z-E-T dot TV. Speaking about web series, I wanted to give you a little more info on one we discussed in the interview, The Chocolate Tourist, which is created, produced, and written by podcast viewer Courtney Matz. It's a great example of how you can do a reality-based web series. The show uh, celebrates chocolate wherever it goes. You can follow them as they tour chocolate factories, festivals, and confectionaries around the world, each with its unique flavor and appreciation for the bittersweet bean that is admired by all. Who doesn't like chocolate? You can get five episodes at thechocolatetourist.tv, new episodes in February, and you can follow Courtney on Twitter at CourtneyWrites, C-O-R-T-N-E-Y, Writes. And speaking about rights for the internet, let's go to my interview with Ross Brown. Enjoy. This is great, and I'm here with writer, author, producer, and professor Ross Brown. How you doing, Ross? Great, Graham. How are you? I'm doing very, very well, thanks. And uh, I appreciate you coming on in full video. We don't always have that treat, and so it's great that uh, you're able to share with us in that way. And uh, you are the author of Bite Size Television. 
I am. And we will talk at your, about your book. Uh, I know that everybody is talking about doing a web series, and uh, and so I appreciate uh, your wisdom. But first, I want to hear, I mean, okay, this, this is a very personal thing for me because, and I'm dating myself a little bit, but okay. <laughs> I loved every single series that you worked on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, as one of one of my students once said, "You're like a Nick at Night classic with it, your credits." Oh, well, <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, even going back to, and I know you you said that um, in your bio that you got started with the Cosby Show, but yeah. I know that you worked on Webster as well, and I even watched that show. Webster was actually my first professional writing assignment. There, I wrote an episode in the sec a freelance episode in the second season of Webster, and then went to the Cosby Show after that. And uh, you know, you've got them in front of you. But for your uh, viewers, listeners, there went on to the Facts of Life. There, mm -hmm. I'm I am the person who is responsible for uh, deflowering Natalie in a literary sense on oh. the Facts of Life. <laughs> um, there and then uh, I worked at a company called Miller Boyette for a bunch of years, which was at Warner Brothers, and they did a lot of the what was called the TGIF programming on ABC. Mm -hmm. Ah, ignore my telephone ringing in the background. <laughs> yeah, that's that's okay. Actually, I gotta I gotta kill mine as well. But and then who's the boss and a whole bunch of other stuff. But why don't you tell me um, how? So you said your your first credit was a freelance episode of Webster, but how did you get started? Like like. Did you go to, to film school, or, or were you wanting to write as a kid? Um, and how, how do you how did you bridge that gap from wanting to get there and getting there? Sure, I, I didn't go to film school. Uh, film schools were pretty rare when I went to college. There, I went to UC Berkeley and was a journalism student, mm -hmm. uh, but never became a journalist. Um, I just uh, I got interested in film when I was in college, and my uh, entry point was that my father was in advertising. So I started doing TV commercials, and I, I my classic story is I started literally at the bottom. One of my first jobs making a TV commercial was I stood in for a dog in a oh, dog food commercial. You stood in for a dog? On my hands and knees, uh, snout near the bowl, because it was cheaper to hire me then to, than to hire a second dog, which would have required a second union animal handler. Oh, my goodness. So that was that was starting at the bottom. I think there was some good natured <laughs> hazing going on as well. Uh -huh. uh, but I, I learned a ton uh, working on TV commercials. From there, I got a chance to be a production assistant on um, movies and TV shows um, and eventually got into the Director's Guild as a second assistant director. I wanted to be a writer, but it, frankly, I wasn't good enough yet. I was hmm. still uh, developing my craft. And so... I wrote spec scripts on the weekend and uh, uh, had a great chance to learn about the business from the production end. Uh, worked on some very good movies as a second assistant director. Worked on uh, the first National Lampoon's Vacation movie. Wow. And Private Benjamin and uh, then a bunch of movies you've never heard of that were obscure. But I really enjoyed it. And eventually I got good enough to get an agent. And mm -hmm. so I, uh, I I got an agent and the agent... Uh, sent my spec script out. It was a spec cheers. Uh, and a few months into it, uh, he called me and said, I got great news. There's this new show that Bill Cosby's doing and, uh, they like your spec script and they want to hire you, but it means you have to go to New York. Wow. And I said, I can't do that. I lived in California. I had been out of town as an assistant director. The, uh, previous year for four months while my wife was pregnant and we oh had an eight old and it just would have destroyed my marriage. And so I turned the job down. This is two weeks before Cosby premieres. Oh and my, my wife's uncle who had helped me find the agents and was a CBS executive said to me, you know what? You're better off. The show's in a terrible time slot. It's against Magnum PI. It's probably not going to last more than 13 weeks. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so it lasted more than 13 weeks and it was the hit of the century. And oh. my wife felt awful. She thought she would destroyed my dream of being a writer. <laughs> and, but it was okay. I had a job. I was an assistant director, a first assistant at that time on uh -huh. a show called Knots Landing, uh, one of the nighttime soaps. Yeah. So we had the bills paid and I got the freelance Webster episode we talked about. And then in the spring, my wife said, uh, you know, we've had more time together. The baby's not so little. If, if they had a job on Cosby next year, you could go. And I said, oh, like they're going to have a job now. Uh -huh. And they did. And I and so I went to New York the wow. next year. So it all it all's well that ends well and uh, still married. In fact, today is the uh, my daughter who was my wife was pregnant with then her 28th birthday. Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, I've got a 28 year old stepson. Um very very cool, yeah. And and so Cosby Show. I mean, you're right. It was awesome, huge hit. And you know, I mean, it, it wasn't Critically necessarily as as uh, as much of a 
you know, global hit. But Facts of Life was a huge show too. And and it, it, who's it the was. who's the boss? I mean, yeah, his some... boss was and Step by Step, which I was the head writer on for six years, was also a, a big hit. I was very very. Uh, fortunate in my career. I really hit the wave, uh, the crest of the wave of sitcoms and in particular family sitcoms, which mm. is what uh, I specialized in uh, for only because that's where the jobs got offered to me. I, I didn't say, gee, I just want to do family sitcoms. Um, but it was a great uh, situation there. It was really fun. My kids were, were fans of the shows I worked on. So it was something we could share. Mm. And I love TV writing because you get to go to work every day and practice your craft. You don't go into development uh, hell like in movies there mm. where scripts just float around for months and years and decades. You go to work and you give it your best shot every day and you get to work with other talented, creative people who are funny. So it was a wonderful life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and now speaking of development, though, you created a number of series. I mean, you created Living, Doll, you, uh, Living Dolls, you created Kirk. You've also done a huge number of pilots like uh, for Mego and, and a bunch right. of others. Yeah, it was uh, it was great thing. Uh, I you know once again I had a particular skill that was in demand when the, in the days when the networks had what they called eight o'clock shows and nine o'clock shows. I was mm -hmm. an eight o'clock guy and very experienced at doing that and had good relationships at most of the major networks. And so um, that that was fun. And Living Dolls, which was only on for ten episodes, but was Halle Berry's first uh, acting job other than modeling and wow uh, Leah Remini was one of the other uh, teenage models in it who became the wife on the King of Queens and has a uh, daytime talk show now or one of the hosts of a daytime talk show now and so we we found some pretty good young talent there the show didn't last but uh, you know that's TV if they if they knew what would work every time they'd have nothing but top 10 shows <laughs> yeah oh, that's don't. for sure that's for sure and so it now tell me at what point did you start teaching uh, I started teaching in the late 90s there. I, I, the, the handwriting was sort of on the wall about what was happening with family, with sitcoms in general, and especially mm -hmm. family sitcoms. And um, I could, that world was closing down. It's kind of opened back up now 10 years or so later. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I was, I'd always been interested in teaching. So I, it was a complete fluke. I, we had dinner with another couple. Uh, the woman had been a writer on my, on step by step. Mm -hmm. And, and I knew she had taught at uh, a college in Southern California, Cal State University, Northridge. Mm -hmm. And I said, so how did you get that job? And she said, oh, your, your timing is unbelievable. They've been calling me this week. I can't teach this year. And they're desperate for somebody to teach the comedy writing class. Oh, so wow. that was Sunday night. I called on Monday. By noon on Monday, they said, yeah, you come on, come teach the class later this week. And so I started teaching and I really enjoyed it. It was uh, it was kind of very akin to being a head writer and nurturing younger writers and mm. mentoring them. And so I could translate a lot of those skills that I had uh, from the writer's room and from my professional writing career into the teaching setting. So I really enjoyed it. And then I got an opportunity to teach at uh, USC, which is, you know, a big, well-known film school. And um, then got a chance to teach where I teach full-time now at Chapman University, which is uh, in Orange County near Disneyland in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And the team came to me when I was a part-timer and said, we, we're interested in hiring you full-time, but you've got to you gotta go get an MFA. We, you know, we, we can't hire you with just a bachelor's degree. Really? Yeah. And so I, I sort of grudgingly said, oh, okay, I'll go. And my wife said, no, you should go. It'll be great. And it turned out to be this like life-changing experience. And I went to this what's called a low residency MFA program. So you're only physically on the campus twice a year for eight days. And then you have traditional 15-week semesters where you mail your work in every three weeks mm -hmm. and your advisor slash mentor gives you written feedback on it. And it, you know, it would be terrible for production. You can't do a production degree that way. But it was a creative writing degree, so it made perfect sense. You can read and write and have a personal exchange. And it was really fantastic. I was so grateful to go there, not just to get the degree, but it opened my writing horizons. I started um, writing plays, which I also do now and enjoy that very much. I, I was kind of a theater dunce. I had never read um, Eugene O'Neill or Tennessee Williams. And so my advisor said, well, you got to read them too. You can't just read screenplays. And so you know, I read them and go, hey, these guys are pretty good. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason why Eugene you know, O'Neill won four Pulitzer Prizes. He's yeah. a really good writer, and it made me a better television writer, made me a better writer in general, and really just broadened my horizons. And 
uh, Tudor's word, the dean then hired me full time at Chapman um, in the film school there and said, help us expand our uh, narrative television program. We've got broadcast journalism, but we don't really have comedies and dramas. So along with my colleague, James Gardner, who's a director and producer, mm-hmm. we've been doing that. And so now we, um, that's where the, that's actually where the, the book came out of the courses at Chapman University. Mm-hmm. Uh, the dean at uh, Chap- the film school at Chapman University came to me uh, in the fall of 2006 and said, could you put together an experimental class on like making videos for iPods? And so there wasn't <laughs> even a terminology for any of this yet. Yeah. YouTube had started, but wasn't part of the vernacular quite yet. And so uh, I said, well, I've been thinking along the same lines there. And I have this idea for a class called Bite Size Television, uh, where they make a pilot for web series. And so I did it and I um, tried to find a book <laughs> to, you know, give to assign to my students and there weren't any and mm-hmm. I couldn't and I, I really had to struggle just to find examples um, of the the form uh, online uh, it just it, it exploded that quickly you know by the next year there were thousands of examples there mm-hmm. but it really took off and and um, and then uh, a publisher got interested uh, in the idea and said, would you be interested in writing a book on this? So I did. And that's uh, the genesis of uh, bite-sized television. And, you know, my students are Im- incredible. They're really creative. Uh, I find there's no shortage of creativity out there. There is uh, a need for craft, and that's mm-hmm. what they need instruction in. They, they're, they're still developing the, the, the craft and the skills necessary to translate their ideas to finished video projects. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so that's been the journey there. And now we've gone beyond uh, the, even the web series and make uh, two full length half hour pilots, uh, single camera um, every year at the school. And they, they've been quite good. One of them is actually getting developed into an hour drama uh, with a, you know, a real Hollywood producer and all of that. Wow. So, great for well, the students. Well, that, that is what, what struck me. And, I, and of course, I mean, I, I went to a film school and, and we did our, our short films and, in film school now this was back when we were actually shooting on film early <laughs> 90, early 90s but um but i i know that going through all of the pre-production production post-production um was it was just a key a, a place to make our mistakes and figure out what worked and what didn't work and obviously i love what's what's happening now where you can literally shoot high definition with a 400 hundred dollar camcorder and edit it on free software that you get for your computer you can post it so easily um but what struck me as i was reading your your book was that the process for a web series is very very similar to the process for a tv series it's just smaller with a lot less responsibility and you can make those mistakes well that's that's absolutely right and that's i mean from a academic perspective that's where we position the courses there there are intermediate level production courses to give the students a chance to make mistakes but we also use them to teach them what a series is about and how you develop the uh concept and the characters from week to week and learn each week i also think the other thing that's fantastic about this uh inexpensive video and web series for writers is they get a chance to see their work actually on screen and they become better writers then you know you learn an awful lot when you see uh the, the, that speech that you thought was just wonderful and you see it filmed and go good lord that's interminable how mm. did somebody stop me from writing those speeches that long or you know, why is this scene two pages? I, I got what was going on a page ago. You you really learn as a how to be a better screenwriter by seeing the work on screen. Mm-hmm. And and also, I know for um, I mean, I think any TV writer could benefit from doing web series um, in the economy. I mean, the fact that you you right. have to tell a complete beginning, meaning, middle, and ending in at most twelve minutes. Oh, yeah. And I, I find with my students' projects, the, the scripts start out being six minutes and they shoot that. And then we're editing down to four minutes almost, yeah. or three almost all the time that you need to be economical. I mean, there, there's some wonderful things out there. I don't know if you've seen five second films. Uh, no. Oh, uh, you can go to YouTube and check out five second films. I think it's the, the, the numeral five dash mm-hmm. and then second film spelled out in letters. And that's what they do. They do. There's a two minute main title or two second main title, five seconds of content and a one second end credit there. And, and, and they, they're just, they're jokes, but they yeah. find 
a very funny way to do it. There was one that was just a shot of a guy um, taping up a poster on a telephone pole that said lost stapler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, that that's it. But they, you know, they find, I think it really, you know, that's the extreme end of it there, uh -huh. but they, they really help train uh, screenwriters to be more economical, to be more visual, to really think about not just the words they're putting on the page, but what the images are going to look like, and how do you, how do the visuals contribute to the story, mm -hmm. and to make and to make every second count. I mean, one of the things I talk about this in the in the book is don't just put up bland uh, credits at the end or the beginning. You know, use the movie Airplane as your model, where yeah. they they got a joke all the way through to the very end, including the um, boilerplate the disclaimer about you know. You know, this cannot be pirated and people will be prosecuted under the uh, U.S. penal code, blah, 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 blah. So there. Yeah. <laughs> so so they, they entertained you all the way through. And I think web series are a great training ground to teach you how to be compelling or entertaining uh, with every tool you have in your toolbox. Well, and, that, and that's that's an interesting point. Um, going back to the airplane example, wh like, why not do that? Um, well, the, I guess the only reason people were doing credits the way that they did was because, well, that's the way the last hundred movies did them. And uh, and I appreciate the Zuckers. I think it was, it was Zuckers, right? Yeah. And they, they, they said, well, why not do some jokes in the credits? Well, and, and network television has been doing this. I mean, network television had a big problem that people were trained to leave during the main titles and the and the end credits there. And so they, the advertisers were upset. So starting around... In the late 80s, they said you have to have outtakes or live action under the, the credits there. And so now that's just standard way you see credits there. And nobody has a lengthy or very few people have lengthy main titles mm -hmm. for sitcom. They, the people I worked for, uh, Tom Miller and Bob Boyette, who were hugely successful television producers, uh, they did Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley and Mark and Mindy and then had another run at Lorimar and Warner Brothers with Step by Step and Full House and mm -hmm. Uh, family Matters, but Tom was a nut for main titles and, you know, had many that were iconic like Laverne and Shirley and Happy Days. But the first main title for Step by Step was, this will seem absurd to you now, mm -hmm. A Minute and 40 Seconds. Oh, I know. I read that in your book. I mean, that is crazy. <laughs> Especially so when you... You, you, you've also got that down. Yeah, you've also got... Uh, and, and again, they're, they're unique. Um, when Lost came out and it was just Lost, and then boom, we're right in the show. Um, right. Or but, another great example of how the, even with a simple thing, you can find little things to uh, spice it up is the the Frasier main titles, which was always the Seattle skyline. But one week they'd have a helicopter going past the Space Needle, and another time they'd uh, they'd have something else there, uh, you know, rain or or lightning or something. And they would, so they would just found a way to make it interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in what I was getting at with the with this question was that um, because it is new and because you're in total control of it, in, in other words, you're not getting network notes uh, <laughs> or, or even EP notes or any, any kind of notes right. on this. This is your baby when you're doing a web series. You absolutely do need to learn from what works in, say, for instance, uh, television. But the sky's the limit in terms of creativity and, and thinking outside the box. And who, who knows? Somebody might come up with a totally different way of doing something just because they – they're not chained by all of these rules and, and precedents and the control of, of the, you know, the people upstairs. Well, it's true. And also you don't, you know, with, with the, especially with the broadcast networks where you, if you don't have 10 million people watching, you don't have a show there. Uh, you know, if you've got 500,000 loyal fans for your web series, that, that's a great success there. If you've oh, got yeah. 500,000 fans for your CBS show, they cancel you before the second commercial. Mm -hmm. it's, and so you don't have to appeal to the lowest common denominator or the broadest common denominator. You just need to find people who are entertained by the things that entertain you. And so, yeah, I agree. It, it totally frees you up creatively. Uh, you don't have, you know, certainly the length can be whatever it is. And it can be different from week to week. It can be two minutes and 37 seconds this week and four minutes and 15 seconds the, the next episode. It, it doesn't have to be cookie cutter every week. And I think people are going to find more and more ways to be creative with the form and, and with the uh, the language and grammar and storytelling techniques of uh, visual storytelling. And they are already, you know, you see all kinds of things 
uh, being experimented with in web series. And, uh, you know, the Hollywood mainstream is aware of this. And so they're, they're watching and they're trying to find people with fresh points of view, fresh voices. They're, you know, they're optioning more and more web series and turning them into uh, some kind of series that the, the annoying orange just got, I don't know if you've seen that uh, web series. It's, mm. it's, it became this viral video hit. It is this kind of crude animation of an orange uh, with a mouth put over the oh, orange. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it insults other fruit. Uh-huh. And it got a big following. And now I think Comedy Central has picked it up to be a, a, a half-hour series. And, uh, you know, you, you see this with uh, uh, CBS tried it with uh, Bleep My Dad Says, as they mm-hmm. would say in the press there, uh, that was a blog originally. And, uh, you know, all kinds of voices will be found the same way they used to go to comedy clubs in the 80s and 90s and find a stand up comic who could present a fresh take on life. Yeah. And now well, people and that's, series do it. That's, that, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly exciting. And I, I, know I, I know I mentioned this a little bit before, but, but really, there's no nothing blocking you if you want to just grab a camera and go and do it. Um, and so, it, but that leads me into one very, very important thing is talking about the landscape. And um, we we touched on it a little bit, but um, the networks have been watching. I mean, they've been watching for the last five years, and and everybody was thinking if this is coming next year, this is coming next year. And every year I've been hearing that, and yet nobody has has really locked on to a way to, I mean, for one thing, to monetize it, right, and and another thing, just to peg what's going to work. Well, I I think it's an evolutionary process, and it's not quite as fast as everybody thought it would be. Um, you know, a lot of people in the book industry thought that that once the internet was here, everybody would just self publish. But of course, people have to find the work and know about it. There, my my own personal opinion is that that the day is coming soon. And, um, and the, the key thing for me, the tipping point, in my opinion, is when it's common that everybody has Internet access on their flat screen TV mm. uh, so that your viewing experience is merged there, that you're not well, making a choice between should I sit at my computer and look at online videos or should I go watch uh, cable television or dish or whatever mm. that, you know, I just. Uh, I, for a guy who writes about uh, web series, I'm considerably behind the tech curve and just got my first flat screen TV uh, this holiday season yeah. and was just amazed at, you know, the guy comes and we got uh, fiber optic in our house, too. And he, and he shows me. So you go here and this is to the Internet and this is to Pandora and this is uh, if you want to order a pizza. And, and so I think when those things happen, mm-hmm. combined with the fact that uh, younger viewers don't distinguish the same way that people of my generation did between broadcast and cable and pay cable and internet videos. It's just, what should I watch for them? Mm. And they, they don't, they don't care whether it's an internet video or, or not. And so they will be more comfortable flipping back and forth between the big bang theory and funny or die. Yeah. Well, they, and, that, and that's an interesting point. And, and, uh, because it, and of course this started and YouTube was all about the the dog chasing his tail and and right. <laughs> and and the squirrel that rides a, a skateboard or or whatever. Um, but I even even just reading your book, I did a quick search and and looked at what was what was hot out there and it, and it just it seems like and as much as we have the guild and sanctuary and lonely girl, uh, we there are dramatic series that that become notorious and viral and that kind of thing but it, it still seems that 90 percent of what's out there is is short comedy either skits it, or um or or sh- even just just uh, virtually um uh, they're, they're, it's yeah. vaudeville you know, it's video vaudeville in yeah. a way yeah and um i you know i i think that's the thing that has worked to this point but again, I, I think that more and more types of content, uh, including uh, nonfiction content, will appear on the internet. There, what on? I work with Suzanne Summers on the TV show Step by Step, and she's mm-hmm. got a new talk show that's on a YouTube channel. She, mm-hmm. you know, she's and I mean, she's a known star and has you know a dozen, I think, best-selling books, and so she can get an audience and she can play in Vegas and all that stuff. But she's going to YouTube to put her show on because she wants control. She doesn't want to 
um, have network interference and all that kind of stuff there and, and gives her freedom. Uh, but you're, to get back to your point about comedy, that, that seems to be what has worked to now because the attention spans are short and it takes a longer time to build a dramatic arc and to get, uh, people engaged by the characters. But I think that will happen over time. Mm -hmm. I really do because I, again, I think as you, you don't want to watch something that's 15 minutes on your laptop necessarily or your iPad. But if you're in front of, you're watching your big screen TV and it becomes less um, of a, a seeming commitment to say, sure, I'll put 15 minutes in to watch this uh, internet uh, drama series here because mm. you're comfortable, you're on your couch, it's the big screen, you're used to watching things at that length on that device. Yeah. And so, you know, now, you know, I, I ask my students frequently when we talk about length and say, Ask yourself this question. When you see big choices of videos to click on, what's the number where you automatically say, no, I'm not going to watch that mm -hmm. in terms of length? And, and pretty much everybody has a number in their head yeah. because, because they're trained to watching it on smaller devices now. But I think that's going to change as larger devices come in, as it becomes uh, more common to monetize uh, products through uh, – um, advertising uh, revenue sharing and, and all of that mm -hmm. and also because the advertisers themselves are now making web series because they've been cut off from the traditional avenues of getting people to know about their product people mm -hmm. have DVRs people have ways to get around 30 second ads on TV so now the Fortune 500 companies are getting into the web series game themselves making what they call advertainment or branded uh entertainment and uh some of it is really entertaining i mean yeah. the, the the best example i can think of right now is the uh the buff uh african-american guy who's the old spice guy oh yeah isaiah mustafa right he's fantastic yeah. it's, a, it's a great thing but you know once again uh, they talk about this in the book it's about the character his character is just a great character he's got a funny attitude of you know Look at your man. Now look at me. Now look at him. Now look yeah. at me. Now he doesn't look like me, does he? But he can smell like me. You know, it's a great, <laughs> it's a great yeah. character and yeah. it makes you want to, uh, you know, watch it. And people will voluntarily go to the internet and watch these videos. And so, you know, there's going to be more and more content there. Um, again, they're relying on comedy, as you point out there, but somebody's going to, Somebody's going to figure out the drama thing. I mean, mm. Somebody always does. My my friend Joel Cerna, who's one of the twenty four creators, yeah. Uh, essentially, what he did with that show was he figured out how to do a thriller on television. Yeah. That that you know, and and he did it incredibly well. And so you know that happened. And he said that show could not have existed if there weren't cell phones. Yeah. So can you imagine Jack Bauer has to pull over to a payphone every ten <laughs> seconds? I mean, that you can't do the show. And so. Yeah. As technology develops and society develops, you know, the, the storytelling develop, develops now. And, uh, and so I, I think somebody will figure out how to do dramas you know, that are compelling and have an audience and can be monetized on the web. Well, I do, and I do think as much as, as, much pe as people have been saying, this is going to happen next year and then doesn't. This is going to happen next year and it doesn't. But at the same time, um, there are certain realities. Like uh, the, the comparison I would make is, is the chairs at McDonald's are designed so that you hit about 15 or 20 minutes and they become uncomfortable and you want to leave. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and sitting at your computer, it's, there are so many other things vying for your attention. You've got your Twitter open. You've got your email that, that maybe it's set to ping every five minutes when there's a new email or, or that kind of thing. And you can, you can start watching something five minutes later, you got a ping of something else pulling you away. Um, and so there, it's designed in such a way to either multitask, which doesn't actually exist, but we think it does, um, or or else you're you're focused on something for a short period of time, and then you move to somewhere else. Whereas when I sit down into my my couch chair, I'm annoyed if something pulls my attention in five minutes. <laughs> No, seriously. Like, I, I, like, I, I, am too, I am too, although I would say my students, uh, when they're on their couch watching the TV, still have their cell phone there or their iPad or whatever. I mean, if, if I say to the class, okay, I want everybody's undivided attention, close your laptops, after about 90 seconds, they look like I've asked them to 
stand there when they need to go to the bathroom. And <laughs> to the bathroom. <laughs> they, they're just so uncomfortable. They, they, well, no, look, I see, really, is there something that you have to know in the next 90 seconds? Uh-huh. That can't but that's the world that they, they live in. They're, they're used to having that kind of, uh, connectivity and constant, uh, stimulation. I, as a, either as an instructor or as an old guy, one of the two there, I worry that their writing skills will diminish because they can't get it quiet enough to fully commit to immersing in the world of the story they're trying mm. to create when they're, when they're writing their scripts, that they're, they're, they're writing the way they view. And so they don't follow it through. I mean, that may be also why we're not seeing as many complex dramas is, is mm. that, that it's quiet and concentration too. Yeah, yeah, it could could very well be. Now, um, one thing I I do want to mention before we get to some viewer questions is, uh, in your book you primarily focused on um, setting up a a, a narrative, a, a dramatic series, um, because in in television reality TV is a massive juggernaut. Um, I think we probably should mention for a second um, creating a web series that's reality based. Like say, oh, for absolutely. instance, uh, one one viewer of the podcast does a, a series called The Chocolate Tourist, and she set up something that could easily work on on a lifestyle channel, uh, but in a short form on the internet. And uh, and I think there is also a huge opportunity for that kind of thing. Um, oh, there's there's no question about mm-hmm. that. And and there there are people who are creating. I just read the other day about a web series. Um, reality based created by the big brothers and big sisters organization that's documentaries about the you know people in their program there so that there's that kind of reality i mean reality is a very broad uh, category for television mm-hmm. yeah. it can be documentary or it can be you know who wants to date my grandmother or whatever that that is but i, I think there are all kinds of ways that that people can create uh, reality series that that can be uh entertaining or compelling or th- those kind of things um and I think that that if that's your inclination, I remember when I was writing the book, I read about a guy who uh, did essentially a celebrity dish program called his name was Michael Buckman or something like that. Mm-hmm. So he did a show called What the Buck, and it was just him in front of a curtain with a light from Home Depot, yeah. and he would dish on celebrities, but he was really funny. And so you know, it can be that simple from a production perspective if the content is interesting or entertaining or or whatever. But yeah, I think reality. Uh, is a huge category for web series there, and it, it's they really fit together very well because you know it, it then ties into your social media and social networking and all of that, and so people who are uh, interested in the same kinds of things can form a community. Mm. Uh, I in my in my non writing time I'm an amateur uh, acoustic guitar player so I go to this uh, site called the Acoustic Guitar Forum and it's just I find it hugely entertaining because uh, guys will go on there and they're all they all talk about uh, gas which is G A S guitar acquisition syndrome because people uh-huh. are always want a bit bigger better newer but they they refer to keepers then and then one guy posted. I'm currently dating a Martin D28. <laughs> and so I just find this entertaining. But I think things like that you could make, if you're interested in acoustic guitar, you could make a reality series uh, in short form about local musicians and just, you know, see who's out there making interesting music. And, you know, any topic you're interested in is a candidate for a reality web series. And, and, uh, and that brings up another huge, huge point, which is that um, in... The network TV has experimented with this, having an online component to their shows. Mm-hmm. Um, I find it really fascinating. Say, for instance, when Lost decided that they were going to release episodes for free online, um, everybody thought, well, it, this is going to take away from your viewership. It actually increased their viewership. And yeah. um, and I think it's, it's because of that network thing. When, when somebody sees something at online, they're at their computer, they're talking to their friends about it. Hey, look, I'm going to watch this online now. And that goes on the Twitter out to 500 people or, or whatever. Um, and I think when people do a, a web and, 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 and the reason I mention this is this is primarily a TV writing podcast. So people who want to break into television, um, are, are watching the podcast. But I think it's a very, very important consideration that if you do choose to launch your show on the internet, you're building a social network of people who are interested in that and are talking about it and are, promoting that for you and if it does 
get to 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, then those are people who will go with you when it goes to the, it's, the big it's screen. It's true. It's true. And this pattern gets repeated over and over again. When television itself first came out in the late 40s after World War II, the movie studios absolutely refused to do business with them. They saw television as the end of the movies. They were the enemy. Jack Warner of the Warner Brothers went so far as to say, Anybody filming a contemporary move, Warner Brothers movie should not show a television in anyone's home. It was just ridiculous. And then wow. they realized, wait a minute, we can promote our business on this thing called television. So they started doing a show called Warner Brothers Presents uh, in the mid-50s where they took their movie library, Casablanca and uh, a couple other shows, uh, Cheyenne maybe or something like that, and made series out of them, the last 10 minutes of which were – behind the scenes looks at Warner Brothers movies about to come out. And so t TV is now doing the same thing with the internet where they, they first saw the internet as the enemy and now they realize, well, wait a minute, we can get social network loyalty this way. I heard somebody speculate on the radio the other day, Ashton Kutcher has a huge Twitter following. Will he be tweeting during episodes of Two and a Half Men uh -huh. to try and increase interest in the show and make people feel uh, you know, part of an inside club or all those things. So yeah, they're going to, they're going to find ways to use the internet to make uh, experiment with content that they might not want to make a full blown pilot on and spend three and a half million dollars on when they can make a $50,000 really high quality internet uh, series and see how it goes and then pick which ones work. They can have value added elements to their traditional programming like The Office or 30 Rock by having uh, mini webisodes just about a particular character. And, you know, they're going to find ways to have this work to their advantage. They always do. They meaning the, the big media players. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, but I think for the, individual because your your shows for aimed at individuals not corporations mm -hmm. and despite what some of our politicians say i don't think corporations actually are people but <laughs> but for individuals trying to break in the opportunity is there to put together your best work display it try and build an audience and uh, show what you can do and and i think that's a tremendous um, field of opportunity for aspiring uh, television writers and others trying to break into the business. Yeah, and uh, and the uh, CES uh, was just this week, and there's lots of new technologies that are coming out. Some of them consumers are not very interested in, like I don't want an 88-inch screen TV. Um, I'm not interested in a 3D TV. But what I am seeing that is something that uh, that consumers are interested in is is like you said connecting the tv um apple is apparently releasing a an apple branded well this is the rumor anyway and yeah, yeah, yeah. a smart television this year which uh given the iphone and ipad i think is probably going to be a huge hit um samsung has a smart tv coming out and, the, and so this is now something that i i think as much as five years ago if somebody said this is happening next year that was not a very true thing that you could right. say but right now i think we could say Within three to five years, we're all going to have our inter internet on the TV. I, I agree with that, and I think that's going to really um, uh, exponentially increase the amount of content and the amount of high-quality content that there is in short uh, webisode forms. And you talk, another reality example, we talked about the Consumer Electronics Show. Mm -hmm. One of my former students um, hosts a weekly uh podcast of called tech foolery where she and a, and, and a guy talk about the latest tech developments there mm -hmm. and so you know here's someone who wants to be an on-camera person and has an opportunity to, to do that without getting permission from cbs or uh, even a cable channel there she's just found a way to do this and you know it is now you can see her career developing that way and i think the same thing will be true for all categories for writers for directors for cinematographers, that there are ways to do this. And as I said, the, the Fortune 500 companies are, are all looking into ways to do this. My, my brother uh, is in the golf industry. He uh -huh. works for uh, Lamkin, a company that makes golf club grips. And he said, yeah, we're talking about doing webisodes about the product there. And, and it might be uh, entertaining or it might be instructional. or they, But everybody knows they got to find new ways to reach the public and uh, this is great news for aspiring filmmakers because it means the amount of work making videos 
is going to uh, just increase year by year by year. And I know that your dream may be to be Steven Spielberg or something, but this is a great opportunity to get your foot in the door, learn your craft, um, and then make your way. You know, talent will rise to the, to the top then. Mm-hmm. Yep. Very, very cool. We do have to get some to some uh, viewer questions. Sure. Um, one of them is from Michael. He said, when putting together storylines for webisodes, is it more advantageous to have closed episodes or an ongoing season arc? Yeah, I, you know, I think I think either can work uh, there. It depends on what the um, what the series is and what the premise is there. I think dramas are probably going to want uh ongoing storylines there, the things that compel you to, to watch the next one. Comedies can go either way. Most network television now has some uh, hybrid of that, some closed-end storytelling as well as ongoing storytelling. Um, I think you, uh, I think it can be challenging to have an ongoing storyline in very short episodes mm. because then, then you get burdened by that. But I think it's... I think having a little bit of both can be uh, uh, liberating creatively because it, you'll see what develops along the way. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, he has a technical question, which I think you address pretty well in your book, but um, uh, that when you're shooting to use an onboard microphone or sync with a separate recording, um, I think dual, dual system, the separate recording is, is always going to be higher quality if if they have the production ability to do that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you don't even have to have um, you can you can have it come into the camera and, and record along with the uh, with the video image there. But I think having an external mic instead of the one mounted on the camera. And the only time when I think having a camera mounted mic is an advantage is if the concept of the series is uh, I, I'm doing a secret video of my parents and mm. see see what they're really like when they're not looking. Then you want it to have that kind of hollow sound to it because it's part of the um, texture you're going for there. But yeah, I, I almost always uh, recommend having a dual system there so that you can have the sound clean. Mm -hmm. And uh, last question from Michael is, um, it, particularly for dramatic videos, is there a sweet spot for the length? Um, I think again that the ask yourself the filmmaker the question what's what's your limit if you see something is 11 minutes you instantly say I'm not going to watch that if that's true then don't make an 11 minute episode there um, I, I think it's tough to be genuinely dramatic in under three minutes but and probably need five there um, but it, it depends on the series and. You know, one of the things that I, I interviewed uh, Marshall Hershkovitz for the book, who, along with his partner Ed Zwick, made the show Quarter Life. Mm -hmm. And and partly what they said was, we've been making, um, telling stories in eight-minute increments our whole life. That's what an act of a television show is. And so that's how they, they went for eight minutes there. And uh, if you watch uh, some of the cable channels, they're even shorter than that. There are more and more commercial breaks. So, But to, to try to be specific about it, I'd say... Seven or eight minutes is probably about right for a drama. Mm -hmm. And uh, and definitely one thing I know is they have to move quickly. They do, they do, and uh, and I think another thing to consider with the drama is to really focus on the main storyline. There, the other thing that can be tough in, in in seven or eight minutes is if you're trying to tell three stories in every single seven or eight minute episode. You know, I think that's uh, an awfully high hurdle to get over. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Courtney, uh, the one I mentioned who makes uh, The Chocolate Tourist, she asks, um, what are the considerations for distribution and marketing when you're making script production decisions? Uh, it's an interesting question there. I mean, I, I think you should have some sort of uh, marketing plan and you should, you know, it's like with everything else, know your audience, you know, know you know, so if she's making The Chocolate Tourist. Where, where are the chocoholics online? Where, you know, where do they go? And so... Um, it, if you can uh, create uh, something on YouTube uh, with a YouTube channel, that that might be great. I mean, I, in most cases, I think YouTube's your uh, first choice for a stop there because everybody knows what it is. It's sort of like Kleenex now. People don't say uh, tissue; mm -hmm. <laughs> they say they say Kleenex, and people you know don't say a video hosting site that often. They say YouTube, mm -hmm. even though they know what Vimeo is and they know what a few other places are there. But it's 
it's high quality. They, you know, you shouldn't have to pay for the servers. They do all that kind of stuff. And they have an ad revenue program. If you do get enough viewers, they'll run that part of the business for you too. Mm-hmm. Very, very cool. Well, I think we're getting pretty close to the end of our time here. I do want to mention your website, bite sized TV or bite sized dot TV rather. Correct. And, um, you know, and the book is uh, available in all the usual places there. And uh, I really encourage everybody who's a TV writer, even if you don't consider yourself a filmmaker, you say, well, I'm just a writer. Uh, think about making web series just to learn about the, the craft and to see your work up on the screen because you'll be a better writer for it. Great. Well, we usually end with, with breaking in tips, but I think we covered a lot of that along the way. Is, are, is there anything in particular you want to say as a tip for breaking into this that would be sort of a first step for somebody? Well, um, you know, there, there are lots of things to say, uh, you know, take your best shot there. I mean, don't the, the thing, it's awfully tempting to just grab a camera and go out and shoot. And I would really recommend against that. I, I would, um, uh, it's a joke between myself and the Dean at my film school. One of our slogans is you get a camera in your hands on day one. And I always say, well, how about a pencil in your hands on day one? You got to work on your idea, develop the characters, develop the script and really, in that format, uh, if you've got access to the actors, rehearse with them first and see, get that's how TV gets done. You know, you rehearse, you hear a reading and make the script as good as possible before you go out and shoot. And then um, time and editing, too. It takes it really takes time and be the, I think the hardest thing for new writers to be is uh, honestly and fairly self-critical. Because you want to love what you're doing, and you have to. We all do. We all write something and go, I've got it, I've got it this time. But then you have to sort of flip around the hat. I think of it as a Sherlock Holmes hat, and one side says creator, and one side says editor. And yeah. when you put the editor hat on, the, cre- the rules are the creator goes first, but then the editor gets his or her say and can be honest, but not brutally honest, helpfully honest. And so yeah, thoroughly honest, sure but not mean because they're friends and they have to work together. Uh And so I think for um, aspiring writers, that's a hard step to take, but I think it's, uh, it's worth doing. And maybe a way to do it is to have a writer's group and to critique each other's work in a supportive, but um, helpful manner. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. And certainly a great first step is to buy bite-sized television and read it because there's a lot of, a lot of what we talked about is covered in in quite a bit more depth in, in the book. Yeah, and I just want to say one more thing about about the book. It's also it's great for people who want to make videos there. It's great for people who want to teach classes in in um, web series writing and production there. It's kind of a kit. It includes the syllabi and some exercises for your students. Because I um, part of why I wrote the book is I couldn't find one for my classes, and mm-hmm. I think more and more film schools are going to be teaching classes in this format because it's ideally suited to film schools. It's what they do best: make short films. Yeah, great. Well, Ross, I thank you so much for taking the time out to to do this interview, and I uh, wish you the best of luck, and uh, hopefully lots of people do buy your book and, and read it, because it's an excellent, excellent resource. Uh, thanks very much, Gray. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and to talk about the book, and good luck to all of you aspiring writers out there. Uh, I did it, so you can do it too. Great. Okay, thanks, Ross. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for scriptwriting information in print and on the web.